Recovery means to me is freedom and peace. There is hope. Recovery is awesome. Recovery works. Recovery is possible. There is hope. Recovery is possible. There is hope. Recovery to me means freedom. Recovery is possible. Recovery works. Recovery is always possible. It's fantastic. Progress, not perfection. Recovery is possible. Recovery works. Recovery is a journey, not a destination. Hello and welcome to Recovery Talks podcast from Montana's Peer Network. I am Jim Haney, the Executive Director. want to welcome you to another episode. And today we are going to be talking about the future of these podcasts and uh, what they're going to look like, sound like, some of the things we're going to be covering. Uh, but before I get into that, I want to say happy Recovery Month 2023. Um, here we are again in the month of September. Uh, there are all kinds of events going on. Uh, both at a federal level have happened this month. Some are still happening. Some are here on a local level, things like walks. I know Montana's Peer Network, we put on our recovery conference every September. We had that a few weeks ago. Uh, if you were there, thank you for attending. It was another outstanding event. Um, it's always great to see members. Um, we do have trainings and, and, uh, <clears throat> throughout the year, but the conference is a different thing. We get to see people and everybody's more relaxed and we're having a good time and we're having fun and we're laughing. And so uh, once again, we did the event and it was, it was, it was great. Next September, we're going to do it again. And each year we keep growing it and uh, we work hard all year to bring you the best workshops and presenters and events that that we can so thanks if you were there if you weren't there i hope you'll uh join us next year but september is recovery month and so we thought we would kick off our new podcast format starting this month and that's what i'm going to be doing today so it's going to be kind of a different type of podcast i got a few things that i want to talk about some things i need to get off my chest and uh, yeah, I mean, what better time than to do that in recovery month? So what are we talking about? So we've been doing podcasts for a number of years now. Some of you may, may be regular listeners. For some of you, maybe this is the first time that you've ever listened to one of our podcasts. Um, and we've been covering uh, recovery and peer support for a long time now. We've done um, all kinds of different interviews, and we're going to keep on doing that. But, 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 here's the big but. As we um, grow as an organization, we're going to start bringing some new material into the, um, the podcast series, and there may be more of these types of episodes where I'm on here talking about things that are happening. Maybe I'm going to bring some guests in and we're going to talk about some current events that are happening that are impacting uh, people in recovery, uh, peer supporters working in the field, um, or just uh, things that I'm noticing that are happening. Um, I think that I want to add this into the mix and we're going to keep on doing the interviews, but current events need to be talked about. Um, and we're going to start doing that. And I'm going to start it today, but you got to tune in uh, a little later in the podcast. I'm going to talk about something that's going on that's very pertinent. So we're going to keep on doing the interviews. We're going to do more recovery stories and wellness stories. What are people doing maybe outside uh, the traditional system. We've been, um, over the years, we focus quite a bit on uh, the system and treatment and that kind of thing. And we're still going to do that, but we're going to bring you some new stuff. Um, I've got some folks in mind lined up who want to come on and want to talk about some things. Uh, we're still going to talk about peer support because we love peer support. This is one of the best ways to change 
the system um, is to have peer supporters working in agencies, providing support to people, providing that sense of hope. But it also does something else that we often don't talk about. And this is something that we're going to bring new to the show also, which is when you have a peer supporter in-house, it begins to change the culture within the agency. And so we want to do that. We want to start changing the culture within the agency. We want to talk about what that's like as a peer supporter. Uh, we're going to do an episode here coming up. Uh, talking to uh, new peer supporters, peer supporters who just start working. And there's a shock value. Uh, for those of you who don't know, never been a peer supporter, you're a person in recovery, and <clears throat> you go to training and you get certified and you have a clinical supervisor and you're all excited. And then you kind of get into the agency and you begin to realize, oh, <laughs> wow, this is going to be a lot tougher than I thought. And we're going to talk and talk about why that's tougher. So we're going to get into that with some new peer supporters. That's a regular feature we're going to start including uh, on the on the show. And so I want that to be part of what we're doing. One of the other things that we haven't talked a lot about in the past on our podcast is how to get involved. How to get involved in the recovery movement. And what do we mean when we say recovery movement. Well, the, some of you may not be aware, some of you are already very involved. You know, there's a, there's a shift that's happening and there's, a, um, and there's a rub with the medical model of treatment and people like me, like some of you who are in recovery, those two don't always go hand in hand. And, uh, Peer supporters know this when you go to work. Um, they don't always go hand in hand. They don't always line up. And treatment or the medical model uh, is very fixated on money and dollars. And recovery is focused on personal growth and development emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually. And those things are often missing in the traditional treatment system. They're things that really aren't paid for by the system, right? They're overlooked or they're downplayed. And so they're not, they're not always apparent and they're not always there. Now, sometimes they are. There's some great uh, treatment providers who incorporate these things, a more holistic approach into what they do. But for the most part, these kinds of things are really not part of the system. And it's very medication based, even in substance use, right? Addiction. Now we're, we're, we're giving people meds. You know, you have a problem with pills and we're giving you another pill to solve your problem. This, this, this doesn't work for most people. Um, and so we're going to talk about this. We're going to bring some people in, but there are ways for you to get involved as a peer advocate as a peer leader, um, and I don't mean just with our organization, I mean in your own community. Uh, maybe it's even your own family. Maybe it's your own self, how to really get connected. And we're gonna have some deep dives into recovery and recovery stories that are happening outside the traditional system and ways you can get involved um, and help to change the system so that it's a more holistic approach. And we need your voice. If, if there's one thing that I've learned over the last 12 years running Montana's Peer Network, building this and advocating and running pilot projects, building programs, consulting, training, boy, if there's one thing that stands out that I have really learned is that um, it, I can't do it alone. I need you. I need you, the person who's listening to this, to get involved, to share your story. Uh, over the summer, I did interviews with many of our members who um, had very different experiences within the crisis system. 
this is something that's very near and dear to me. I'm a two-time suicide attempt survivor, interacted with the crisis system uh, in the beginning of my recovery. And I interviewed a number of our members, asking them to share their experiences. And, you know, it's the, they're, they're wide ranging, but there's a theme that runs amongst all of them. And we're going to bring some of those people on. And we're going we're gonna to talk about this. We're going to talk about this on a real personal level. Um, one of the other things that we're going to talk about that hits all of these topics, current events, recovery stories, peer support, how to get involved, the recovery movement, is we're going to talk about the broken system. I'm going to say that again. We're going to talk about the broken behavioral health system and what's being done about it. One thing that's been in the news here in Montana quite a bit is this $300 million pile of money that a bunch of politicians set aside because they're going to change the system, quote, in their own words, for future generations. And this money has been set into an account and they hired a consulting firm and there's all these committees and I, every, everybody pretty much on my staff is on different committees and we got peer supporters and people in recovery and agencies and everybody's putting all this time and effort into it. And, and we're going to follow this along in our podcast series. This is this really is its own little nugget. It's a current event, but it hits on so many of these other topics. And I can tell you, um, we're about two months into that process where this consulting firm, Guidehouse, great bunch of people who I've met, you know, a couple of meetings now, asking questions, presenting information, sharing the other, I don't know how many committees, steering committees, subcommittees, committees for subcommittees, you know, um, a lot of people involved. And in an account sits $300 million set aside and Guidehouse is going to make recommendations in March of 2024. So we're going to do a podcast after every one of these meetings. So we've had uh, two. There's there's a couple more. There's going to be October and November, and we're gonna we're gonna do podcasts and we're gonna talk about our takeaways from these from these meetings. That's one of the things we're gonna bring. And again, this is something different. If you've been a listener of the show, these are. These are some topics that we haven't talked about, and I'm going to share my thoughts. Um, and right off the bat, one thing I want to throw in here about this is I, I, I love the fact that we've set aside a large chunk of dollars. I've been told by multiple people because when I go to these meetings, I ask a lot of questions. I want to know how this is working. And there's a commission. And you can look this all up um, and see when the meetings are. They're all free to the public. Anybody can attend these meetings. Um, I invited a member to our last meeting who was asking me lots of questions. I said, well, just why don't you come to the meetings here? I'll send you the invite. You know. Um, but anyway, I love it that they've set aside this money, $300 million. and and it, but I do have to wonder why it was 300 million. 300 million is the same amount of money that Montana holds in a uh, emergency fund that was set up uh, by previous governors. I can't remember which one it was, if it was Schweitzer or Bullock. I think it was Schweitzer. Um, set up this fund, put 300 million in it, and you know, we use it for things like wildfires, for example, can be very costly in the summer. Uh, this particular summer, we didn't use any. Anyway, the money sits in there. We have to keep at least 300 million. And it's funny that the money that they set aside for behavioral health, building a better system, better future, um, is also 300 million. And I wonder if there's some sort of connection there, or that was just an arbitrary round number. Like, 
it's a lot of money, but it's not too much money and it's not too little money. And it makes us look like we're do actually going to do something. But, you know, I, I don't know how they came up with it. Um, that part's not clear. There's a lot of stuff in this that's not clear because this was hidden from most of the legislators and it was hidden from the public until the very end of the 2023 legislative session. Now, I'm not I'm not in the inside of the political world. I don't want to be on the inside of the political world. I think it's an ugly place. But this was hidden until the very end and then this big announcement happened and everybody slaps themselves on the back and pats themselves on the back for what a great job except there were a lot of people left out. So maybe these committees and subcommittees and committees for subcommittees and committees on top of steering committees and all that, maybe all that is the way they're trying to include people. I hope it is. Um, so the money's been set aside. We're going to fix the system and uh, this process we're going to talk about. It's one of the things we're going to talk about on this podcast series. I think this is monumental in the history of the behavioral health system for Montana. And um, we need to put the information out there. So that's one of the things that we're going to really delve into. It's fresh in my mind, as you can tell. I'm kind of talking about it here for a while because I think I, I have to feel like the average Montanan has no idea that this is going on. It's really only the people who are, quote, in the know. And Montana's Peer Network is in the know within the system in terms of like we're invited and we're invited to be a part of all aspects of it. So anyway, we're going to talk about that. So I hope so far what I've been touching on is resonating with you, okay? Because this is an example of a way you can get involved. And we're gonna talk a lot about ways to get involved. We're gonna bring that to these Recovery Talk podcasts because getting involved, uh, whether you wanna become a full-on advocate, whether you want to uh, become a peer supporter, whether you want to volunteer maybe on a committee or even the Montana Peer Network Board of Directors, you know, we're recruiting people. Um, this is this is this is how one of the ways you can grow in your own recovery is by giving back, by getting involved with something. And not just, you know, I live in my sphere and I'm just here for myself, but actually giving your time and your knowledge and your experience. And learning, it's a real growth experience when you do that. So we're going to talk a lot about that. And we're going to um, help support you in your growth along the way. And, you know, over the years, we've had uh, many board members who um, just blossom is the word that comes to mind. Uh, just blossom while they serve in a role like on the board of directors, or maybe they go on and become uh, peer supporters. But finding your voice, this is another key element in recovery, finding a voice for yourself, right? So <clears throat> current events, current events, current events. So, uh, one of the things I've been noticing over the last number of years is uh, recovery in general has become very mainstream. Television shows, movies, you know, we got politicians and actors and musicians and CEOs of big companies. People are coming out and saying, I, I'm in recovery. I have a mental illness or I have a substance use issue. And it's become very fashionable. And this is not um, this is not where I started. This isn't the way society was when I started in my recovery journey back in the mid 90s. Uh, it wasn't that way. It wasn't that way at all. 
and you didn't see movies with people with mental health diagnosis or people with uh, PTSD. It's become very, you know, in. And, and that's all great. Like we've brought recovery out of the shadows. The recovery movement has pushed it out of the shadows because that's where it started, hiding in a corner somewhere. Um, I tell this story about uh, my first 12-step meeting. I'm somebody with a, with a dual diagnosis. Mental health is my primary diagnosis. I used alcohol to cope with what was going on in my head. I was very unhealthy. My first 12-step meeting that I went to was an AA meeting, was in a place I was told since I was a kid never to go. And that place, it was down a dark alley. That's right. That's where I was supposed to go for help and support, down a dark alley. When I was a young kid, I can remember my grandparents telling me, you know, don't walk down the alleys, Jimmy. Stay on the street side, walk down the sidewalk. I grew up in uh, Chicago, Cicero, and don't go down alleys. Don't go down dark alleys, even worse. And I remember pulling up to this, <clears throat> to the address, and I didn't see it straight away. And then I realized, oh, it's down the alley. Sure enough, you had to park and walk down a dark alley. And that's where I was going to go to change my life. So that was my experience back in the 90s. That's not the experience today that most people have. It's very in um, it's really all over the place. Uh, in fact, I was just watching a, a sporting event and there was an ad came on in the commercial break for, you know, do you have an addiction issue? Do you want to change your life? You know, call this number, blah, blah, blah. You know, it was like an infomercial and it, whoa, wait, what's this? You know, and it actually came on a couple of times. So I got to really watch it and it was not a company that I recognized but, um, you know, virtual support and counseling and psychiatry and support groups done virtually over Zoom, that kind of thing is very in now. It's very, very in. The state of Montana is uh, making permanent the temporary rules that were put in place during COVID to be able to provide things like counseling and peer support over platforms like, like Zoom. Um, so we're not going into facilities as much anymore. We're doing it from home. You're at home. You're more comfortable. And there's pluses and minuses to all of that. And, you know, just while I'm saying it, I'm thinking, man, that's a great podcast uh, episode just in and of itself right there. Right. But this whole thing, uh, this whole virtual piece that is now entered into healthcare in general, just in all of healthcare. But it's really gotten into the recovery treatment services. Um, and so one of the things I've been noticing over the last few years is there's a real dark element that has entered into the scene in the recovery and behavioral health world. And I don't know if any of you have noticed it, but it's concerning to me. Um, the recovery movement used to be all peers like myself who were passionate about helping other people, starting peer networks and starting treatment programs and recovery homes and peer respites and doing good work because they wanted to help people. And the narrative is, is shifting within the recovery movement. This is our own people. This is people in recovery. It is shifting to a greed-based system of, I want to make money off of other people's illness. Now, some of you are thinking, well, isn't the treatment system already like that? Yes, it is. I agree with you 100%. But I've been involved for 15 years now, 12 through Montana's Peer Network, three with the Drop-In Center. And it has shifted dramatically to a 
to, and there's an element, and I'm trying to think of how to describe it exactly, but it's an element, it's a dark element that has entered into this really good, good, good work that people in recovery are doing, have wanted to do, um, and it's about money. Like the pharmaceutical companies who don't give a shit whether somebody gets healthy or not, they want you to take their pill the rest of your life. Um, treatment centers who don't really care, they move you through like cattles, you know, uh, you move through, you get your quote unquote treatment and out the door you go and we don't give a shit about you the very next day. That's commonplace in the treatment system and it is now becoming more and more prevalent. It's not common, but it's becoming more and more prevalent within the recovery world, within the recovery movement. And so I've been thinking a lot about this. In fact, I had this idea, I wanted to write this book about it because it was bothering me so much. And now I see, here it is, right? So what do I see? So uh, I try to stay up on current events, right? And I'm looking at the news here in Montana. And this is, um, you know, right here in Montana, Billings, Montana news. This is, uh, you know, Q2 news. This is from August 3rd. And you can check this out online. Um, they're reporting on a recovery residence scam out of Arizona. So, who oh, that got my attention. What is this thing? You know, so I read the article and uh, Diane Parker reported on this back in August. And I and I saw this and I went, oh, there it is. Right. There it is. There's what I'm getting the sense of this darkness. So she talks about this because um, in her article, she talks about uh, four Northern Cheyenne members who were thought they were going to a treatment program, a recovery residence down in Arizona, and it turned out to be a scam. That's right. I'm going to say that again. People going into treatment for substance use promised treatment, detox, a place to live, healthy environment. And it turns out it's a scam. So what's the scam, you know, and it's these fraudulent sober living homes buy you a, a, a plane ticket, in this case in the Phoenix area, Arizona, and, and the promise is a 90 day treatment program and then a ticket back home. Because here in Montana, we don't, we don't have detox in the state of Montana, folks. We don't have that. That's not part of our treatment system. We don't care about you detoxing. We don't have that. So people look to other states who have these programs, right? And, and so folks bought into this thinking they were going to get help. They get there and they find out the home was suspended by the state of Arizona and no, no ticket to go home, right? So one of these individuals, you know, is talking about, hey, you know, I was told I was going to get 72 hour detox. I went there, no detox. And they told them, hey, just uh, sleep it off, right? So if you read more into this article, like, what is this all about? How are we scamming people with this, you know, right? So they found out more than somewhere between five to 8,000 people. And I've looked at a few different articles here now uh, say they were victimized as a quote, part of a widespread Arizona Medicaid scam. Arizona officials say fraudulent sober living homes have lured indigenous people to the state where they were provided free housing, but no treatment. Those fake providers then allegedly build Medicaid for services up to $1,300 per person per day. $1,300 per person per day. So if you multiply that out, that's $117,000 per person. And there's somewhere between five and 8,000 people, okay? 
that total is more than $500 million. This is what I'm saying, this dark element that's come to the recovery movement. I've been sensing this and, and here it is, boom, right? And so it's not just the news here. ABC News ran a report back in June, quote, a widespread Arizona Medicaid scam that's left an unknown number of Native Americans homeless and on the streets of Metro Phoenix is being declared a public health state of emergency by the Navajo Nation as fraudulent, sober living homes lose their funding. Right? So this is going back even two months before that. So the people who went down in August, the home was already closed. The company was still trying to scam the system even then, even afterwards. NPR, National Public Radio, ran and ran a, 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 a bit on this in August, on August 31st, 2023. Fake sober homes targeting Native Americans scam millions from taxpayers. I mean. Is this where we're at now? Because it's it's cool and it's in vogue, right, to be in recovery. So we actually have fraudulent people in a state targeting other states because they've already used up all the people there. So now they're reaching out to other states, okay, and they're advertising to them. I don't know how they're advertising, right, but they're advertising. And, and people think they're going there for treatment and they're using the words like recovery and support groups and detox and, right? They're using these words and they're ripping people off. They're ripping off the state of Arizona has been, has lost all this money. Uh, people aren't getting the treatment they need, right? And they're, they're just doing this just Hey, okay, let's go ahead and do that. Let's go ahead and hurt these vulnerable people even more. Like their lives aren't hurting enough. Let's get into the recovery world where people have drug and alcohol problems going on, mental health problems, trauma problems, and let's harm them even more. It's it's really, really something. Uh, and if you if you look up any of these articles, you will see that um, this is not just Montana. New Mexico was targeted, right? Being right right next door to Arizona, uh, they were targeted, and all these people went to these so called sober living homes, right? And there's no treatment that's going on, right? And they're just billing. And you know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of 15 years ago when I started this type of work. I went to work for the largest mental health center provider at that time in Montana. And, and they had funding to start a drop-in center. And that was what I did, was built a drop-in center from the ground up. And that's what this reminds me of. That organization was so focused on money, not people's well-being. It was really shocking to me to sit in staff meetings and the discussions that we had that weren't about wellness, weren't about getting people healthy. It was about how much we can build the gravy train. The gravy train was Medicaid. That's what it was about. How much can we build? And there was not as much talk about people's wellness as there was about money. It was definitely not balanced. And uh, that company today is, is much smaller than it was back then. It is uh, been downsizing slowly but surely. And eventually it probably will just fade away. Um, but that was the first time I ever got wind of anything like that. But now here it is, national spotlight. Um, a bunch of people down in Arizona have been arrested. The, of course, attorney general's involved and uh, the FBI's investigating and they're going after folks. Um, it It is really, um, 
it's really incredible. And I, I'll give you a quote here, Medicaid fraud on a grand scale. This is on the NPR in May, 2023, Arizona Governor Katie Hobbs led a press conference and she said, today we're announcing actions against over 100 providers of behavioral health, residential and outpatient treatment programs that have credible that we have credible reason to believe have defrauded the state's Medicaid program of hundreds of millions of dollars. 100 providers preying on people with substance use issues. <sighs> it's really, it's really incredible. There have been 45 indictments brought down so far by the attorney general's office against uh, individuals. So I'm glad to see that they're doing something about it, right? Um, but I think that this problem is not going to go away. I think that we're just seeing the start of it. And I think it's going to get a lot worse. And this is what's going to do in the recovery movement. This is what's going to change the narrative because people are going to, the general public is going to start to see this type of scamming and fraud and deception within the recovery movement. And they're going to blame those of us who are in recovery, even those of us who are doing good work. Having integrity is at the forefront of Montana's peer network in how we conduct ourselves. And I talk to this all talk about this all the time with staff and board members, but that's not the way our society is anymore. And, and this type of thing in Arizona is just the start of it. And I think you're going to see more states, and this is what's going to bring it all down. This is the heyday right now for mental health and substance use funding. The feds have been pumping billions with a B out to states to increase services. But I'm telling you here in Montana, the system is more broken today in 2023 than it was 15 years ago when I started. It's more broken today. It's more dysfunctional. Um, you have a different type of landscape. It's not working. It doesn't work for the people who need the help. It doesn't work for the families. It doesn't work for the provider agencies. It doesn't work, you know, as an advocacy organization. We see these things and, and we're trying to improve it, but it's more broken today than ever before. And there's way more money. There's way more money that used to be the mantra in the 12 years that we've been that we've been around. It used to be that there wasn't money. Today there's tons of money laying around. The DPHHS has money sitting around for behavioral health. They don't put it out in RFPs. It sits there unspent because they can't keep up. They don't have enough staff. They don't they can't get it out the door fast enough. These are real problems and and we're going to face the end of that. There's going to come a time where the pendulum will swing back and there won't be funding. So we need you to get involved. We need you to reach out. We need you to talk about these issues. And that might mean talking to your local legislator. It might be involved in a council or a board. It might be getting involved with MPN. We need your voice. We need your story. I invite you to come and be a part of this. This is one little example. You can look this up. You can, you can put this in. I gave you, you know, some great, uh, very credible sources. And um, we need you. We need you as listeners. We need you to like and subscribe to this podcast. Okay. And uh, if you support and you like what MPN is doing, go on our website, make a donation. It can be five bucks. Okay. It could be five bucks. Anything. Help us keep getting the message out. Help us keep talking about this. And this isn't the end of talking about recovery residences because I'm working on getting. Uh, the recovery residents, national recovery residents, uh, folks, board members, I want to have them come on and do a podcast and talk about what's being done in Montana around recovery residences. That's going to be in a future episode. So 
Thank you so much for tuning in. This was a very different kind of podcast than what we would normally do, but we're going to bring you more of this kind of thing, more current events uh, in the future. And thanks so much for tuning in. Tell other people in recovery about it. And no matter where you're listening to us on our website or iTunes or SoundCloud, subscribe so you can get all the latest episodes. Thanks so much and have yourself a great fall. There's always hope. Recovery is possible. Recovery works. There's hope in recovery. Healing takes time. Recovery means resilience. You you can get through anything. Recovery works. Recovery!